Today's webinar is titled Bite-Sized Tips from Your Registered Dietitians, and we're going to be exploring the topic of meal planning. We're so excited to share information with you that you can apply directly to your current dietary practices. My name is Lindsay Moran, and presenting with me today is Kate Newmer. We are the registered dietitians here at Connect Care 3, and it's our job to help you with any and all things nutrition related. In today's presentation, we're going to define meal planning and preparation and explore reasons why you might try it. We're going to then walk you through different types of meal preparation so that you can find one that best suits you and your needs. We'll then walk you through some meal planning and preparation steps. And finally, we're going to explore some examples of different meal plans and even some recipes to try. So let's get started. So what comes when you think of meal planning? Do you think of those perfectly sectioned containers with a week's worth of food portioned out? Or maybe you picture a large binder with multicolored labels depicting your meals for the week. Or maybe you yourself have tried meal planning and haven't quite figured out what it looks like yet for you. What we will say is that there are many ideas of what meal planning is supposed to look like, and what you should know is that it really looks different for everyone. Today, we hope to leave you feeling inspired and reassured that meal planning can have multiple approaches and help you find what works best for you. So to kick off, let's think about why you might consider meal planning. So first, I'd invite you to think to yourself, you know, what are some reasons that you might meal plan? Why would meal planning be beneficial to you in your life? There are several reasons that, you know, one might try to meal plan. Maybe you're trying to improve your eating habits or meet certain nutrition needs or goals. Maybe you're trying to add variety to your eating patterns or to feel more prepared and organized. Or you might be trying to save time or money. Whatever your reason is, meal planning can be a great option for you. As we mentioned, meal planning can look different for everyone, so we thought it might be easier to discuss what meal planning is not. So first, meal planning is not rigid, or at least it shouldn't be. You really will need to tailor your meal planning to fit you and your family's needs. Customizing is truly one of the benefits to meal planning. Meal planning is also not a one-style-fits-all approach. Today, you will learn about several methods of meal planning, but even so, you might find the need to be flexible and experiment with different approaches. You might find that one style works well for some parts of your week, whereas another style might be preferred in other areas of your life. Sticking to just one approach can really limit your options when it comes to meal planning. <clears throat> meal planning does not always have to be home cooked. You might be thinking, well, isn't that the goal of meal planning? However, a flexible meal planner makes room for leftovers and even meals out during the week. This can often help avoid you know, food waste and even help with sustainability because you can include some of your favorites and variety throughout the week. And lastly, meal planning does not always mean it's more expensive. In fact, if done thoughtfully, you could actually be saving money with meal planning. You can buy in bulk, you have more chances to use coupons, and you even avoid food waste. So to help you get started, Lindsay and I have developed a few bite-sized tips for the meal planning process. Let's chat about it. All right, so yeah, we're gonna get started looking at the meal planning process. First thing to do when figuring out meal preparation is to identify what your personal style is. There are several styles of meal preparation, including batch cooking, make-ahead meals, individual meals, and ready-to-cook ingredients. Your schedule, preference, storage space, ingredients, and family needs will all likely dictate which style is going to work best for you. And not to worry, your style can change. It's not something you need to stick with permanently. One week, maybe you'll batch cook, and the next you might just focus on individual meals. Some weeks, there might even be a combination of meal prep styles. It's really up to you. So let's take a closer look at each of the methods of meal prep and discuss the pros and cons. Our first type of meal prepping style is called batch cooking. Now, batch cooking is the method that involves cooking large portions of different ingredients at once and then storing for use later. 
For example, you might cook all of your rice for the week or roast all of your vegetables. Meals are not necessarily assembled with this style of cooking until later on in, in the week. With this method, food is often frozen or refrigerated until ready to use. Some benefits to this method include that it's a convenient way to have your food ready to go for the future, especially if you are anticipating some busy times ahead. For example, you might choose to cook all of your vegetables or, and then reheat them later with your protein. I enjoy this method for some of my grain options, like rice. This is also a cost-effective method because you will usually buy in bulk, which can save you money in the long term. Additionally, batch cooking can also allow you to mix and match ingredients and really listen to your taste buds that day or week. Let's say, for example, you cook two proteins, two grains, and two vegetables that you store for later. If you aren't feeling one of the options tomorrow night, you can always use the other and mix and match your meals for the week. A con to this method is that you will spend more time in the beginning of your week prepping and cooking your ingredients. Depending on the amount you are batch cooking, it might take over the course of a day or two, so factor that in with this method. Additionally, because you are prepping ingredients in bulk, this method does not individually portion your meals, so be mindful that you make enough and portion when you make the meal the day of. Lastly, with this style of meal prep, you do run the risk of food spoiling, so make sure you're storing properly and not for too long. Another similar meal prep method is called make-ahead meals. In the make-ahead meal prepping method, you use similar approach to the batch cooking method, but you now form the full meal and store for use later versus just having those separate ingredients. For example, this could be baked oats made to be eaten throughout the week. It could look like a dinner casserole or soup and chili made ahead of time and then reheated. The benefits to this method is that you have a meal in a matter of minutes. And this honestly fares well for someone who's on the go a lot or does not have a lot of time to cook more than maybe one or two days a week. This method can also be great if you have an upcoming busy season. Maybe you are expecting a baby or awaiting a surgery. This style can also be beneficial for portion, portioning your plates since the meal is already put together and can be stored in pre-portioned containers. Using the make-ahead meal method is also cost-effective since your plan will be to make the food right away and then eat it throughout the week, minimizing your food waste. This style is conducive for those who like cooking in bulk with crock pots, instapots, or even casseroles. Some downsides to this method is that you will be repeating meals during the week and that this doesn't work well for people that don't like eating the same thing multiple days in a row. Similar to batch cooking, you are also spending a larger amount of cooking time up front or even in your free time, so take that into consideration. Next, let's chat about individual meal prepping. All right. So individual meal prep is somewhat similar to those make-ahead meals, but more so focuses on preparing full, fresh meals to be refrigerated that can be quickly grabbed and consumed on the go with minimal further prep. For example, you might make a turkey and cheese sandwich with a side of carrots and an apple the night before work. Put it all together in a bag and have it available to quickly grab for your lunch on your way out the door the next day. Another example might be if you were to put all of your ingredients you need um, for a smoothie into containers ahead of time, store them in the freezer or the refrigerator so that all you need to do is blend once it comes time to eat and prepare those smoothies. The benefits to individual meal prep include having ready to eat meals on hand when you need something that's quick and requires minimal prep time. It saves time during your busy week and makes things a little less hectic as you're working towards your nutrition goals. Finally, this method can also help you to plan out your nutrition. For example, if you know that you're having, again, maybe that turkey and cheese sandwich with carrots and an apple for lunch, you can plan your breakfast and dinner accordingly to help you meet your nutrient needs. You know what gaps you need to fill the, for the remainder of the day and can avoid being too repetitive with ingredients. Some cons to this method include the time commitment up front. Depending on how you choose to individually meal prep, this may or may not be an issue. 
If you're someone who's just preparing one meal the night before, it might not take you more than five to 10 minutes. Whereas if you're going to prepare multiple meals for several days of the week, it can take a longer chunk of your time up front. Furthermore, it's important to consider the shelf stability of the foods that you're choosing to prepare. If they're going to be sitting in the refrigerator for more than three to four days, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that they're still safe to eat and of course that they're still tasty. Being mindful of expiration dates and the freshness of ingredients is important in this method. I often see this method being used by parents of school-age children, as it can be really helpful to make mornings a little bit less chaotic. If lunches have been packed the night before and are ready to go, it's one less step to think about while you're trying to catch the bus. Plus, it ensures that your kids are getting a nutritious meal and not just whatever you had lying around to quickly toss in their backpack in the morning. So finally, we'll move on to our last meal prep style, which is ingredient prep. Ingredient prep is my personal form of meal prep, as I'm someone who doesn't like to spend a lot of time cooking on the weekend and reheating similar meals throughout the week over and over again is not my cup of tea. Ingredient prep is defined as preparing your ingredients ahead of time to reduce overall cooking time when making your meal. For example, Maybe you come home from your weekly shopping trip on Saturday or Sunday, unpack your groceries, and think about the meals you've planned to eat for the week. If there's a salad on the menu, you might wash all your lettuce and chop up the veggies. If you're planning to snack on grapes and blueberries, again, maybe those will be washed and put into containers so that they're easily accessible for your snacks throughout the, the week. Maybe you'll hard boil some eggs that can be added to your salad as a source of protein or used in another dish. Or you might cube up some chicken and throw it in a marinade so that it's ready to be cooked tomorrow night for dinner. I usually think of this method as taking 30 to 60 minutes to do any task that's going to help you to stick to the meals you've planned for the, that week. I really like it for a few reasons. Number one, it allows you to save time throughout the busy work week. You'll do the bulk of like that prep work ahead of time, and all that's left is cooking and assembling the meal that you choose to eat. This also allows you to create fresh meals and avoids the need for reheating something that was cooked a few days before. Finally, still gives you room for flexibility. If something comes up, you can make a change or choose a different meal for that particular night. You won't be left feeling stuck. On the contrary, ingredient prep still requires you to find time for your daily cooking. Sure, the time might be less um, as you'll have some ingredients prepared, but it's not going to be as quick or as seamless as a make-ahead meal or individually meal prepped meal. Finally, it also becomes very important to consider food quality and freshness with this method. You don't want to prep your ingredients that might end up spoiling before you get a chance to use them. Becoming familiar with food safety guidelines will help you to avoid this problem. And we'll talk about that in a later slide. So I ask you now, you know, take some time to think to yourself, what are some pros and cons to you? Which of these styles might work best for you and your lifestyle? There are ways to personalize your prep. Next, we're going to talk about personalizing your nutrition. Now that you have a better understanding of personalizing your meal prep style, let's talk about tip two of the meal planning process, personalizing your nutrition. As dietitians, we know there can be many factors to consider when it comes to nutrition. First, think about your own nutrition needs as well as your family's. You might consider things like current medical conditions, your personal health goals. As dietitians, we know there can be many factors to consider when it comes to nutrition. First, think about your own nutrition needs as well as your family's. You might consider things like current medical conditions, your personal health goals, food allergies, and food preferences. Next, we can use the tools around us to help guide our overall nutrition picture. Take the MyPlate, for example, which can help to assure that we are get getting a variety of food groups throughout the week. Also, knowing and implementing the dietary guidelines for Americans can make us inform shoppers and eaters when we are creating our meal plan. <clears throat> 
We realize the effort and complexity that sometimes can add to meal planning. And as registered dietitians, both Lindsay and myself encourage people to use their resources. And this includes working with a dietitian. We enjoy helping our clients to personalize their nutrition and find an approach that fits their needs. So when considering your nutrition, make sure to stay up to date with those dietary guidelines for Americans. So as Kate said, when personalizing your nutrition, it's important to first become familiar with the components of a healthful, well-balanced eating pattern. And the Dietary Guidelines for Americans 2020 to 2025 does a great job of highlighting some things to consider when creating that healthful diet. First, the Dietary Guidelines include three dietary principles, and they are the following. Number one, meet nutritional needs primarily from foods and beverages. Number two, Choose a variety of options from each food group and consider the my plate, which we're going to talk about next. And number three, pay attention to portion size. Furthermore, the guidelines also encourage that you follow a healthy dietary pattern at every life stage, that you customize and enjoy nutrient dense foods and beverages that reflect your personal preferences, cultural traditions and budgetary considerations that you focus on meeting food group needs with nutrient dense foods and beverages and stay within your recommended calorie limits. And last but certainly not least, it's recommended that you limit the intake of foods and beverages that are high in added sugars, saturated fat, and sodium. So all of that can seem a little bit challenging or overwhelming to start sorting out and thinking about, okay, well, what do I do? eat healthier. So we're going to talk about how easy some of those first steps can be. The USDA's MyPlate is a helpful guide in choosing healthy, well-balanced, and nutritious meals that follow those recommendations of the dietary guidelines. As you can see on the image, the MyPlate helps to guide you into making well-balanced choices at mealtimes. It suggests that you fill half your plate with fruits and vegetables, a quarter of your plate with grains, such as brown rice, pasta, whole grain breads or crackers, and the final plate with lean sources of protein. So things like chicken, fish, lean, lean cuts of meat, or plant-based protein sources. The plate also encourages intake of low fat dairy products, such as reduced fat milk, cheeses, and yogurt. If you're looking for a simple place to start, try modeling your next meal after this guide. Think to yourself, is half of my plate full of fruits and veggies? Did my meal include a source of protein, a whole grain? If not, what changes can you make to align your next meal to the my plate pattern? Remember, it's okay to start small. Let's say most of your meals currently only contain protein and grain sources. Maybe you'll try by adding a serving of fruit to your next lunch or a favorite non-starchy vegetable to dinner a few nights per week. Starting to change your diet is as simple as that. So let's look further at the My Plate food group recommendations. When coming up with your meal plan, it's a great idea to factor in these different food groups that you should be eating. Now, although eating perfectly is not the goal nor realistic, try to incorporate these serving recommendations when you plan out your meals. Again, these are general portion recommendations, so keep in mind your own individual needs might look different. For fruits, we need about two cups a day. Ask yourself, did I select at least enough for two servings of fruit per day? This could be a bag of apples, some frozen blueberries, dried mango, or canned peaches. For vegetables, we need about two to four cups a day. Consider fresh varieties, but also rotate in some frozen or canned options to get you through the later part of the week. For grains, we want to try and make half of them whole grains. Aim for three to five ounces of grains per day. And to give you an idea, one slice of bread or half a cup of pasta or rice is equal to about one ounce. We also want to aim for five to seven ounces of protein a day. For protein servings, you can really use a variety of sources, both from animals and plants, such as eggs, fish, poultry, beef, beans, and even soy. So to give you an idea of serving size, typically a deck of cards is about three ounces of protein. 
And finally, on average, we need about three cups of dairy a day. This could come from milk, yogurt, cheese, or even non-dairy milk options, which add the calcium back to the product. When you are looking over your meal planning ideas, try to locate where you have used these food groups. If you feel your meals are lacking or a food group is missing, you could aim to include them in the snack in between meals or even as a side to an additional current meal you have planned. My plate and the food groups are a great tool to help guide those meal ideas and to consider your overall nutrition into your meal planning. So the dietary guidelines for Americans do recommend reducing our added sugar intake. So what are added sugars? Added sugars are just one type of carbohydrate and they typically come from sugar that is added to foods during processing. Sources include things like table sugar, corn syrup, and even molasses. Although we need carbohydrates for quick energy and function, too much of the added sugars can lead to unwanted health implications. The Dietary Guidelines for Americans recommend that we limit added sugar to less than 10% of our calories per day. For example, if you were consuming around 2,000 calories a day, then you would only need 200 calories from added sugar, which ends up being at less than 50 grams. Now, most of us don't live in the world of these numbers, so let's talk about what that might look like. The American Heart Association gives even further recommendations for added sugar. Men are recommended no more than nine teaspoons or 36 grams per day, and this is actually less than one can of soda. Women are recommended no more than six teaspoons or 25 grams of added sugar per day, which is a little less than a Snickers bar. Again, this is an individualized recommendation, but gives ideas on what to aim for. Added sugar can certainly fit in in moderation, but be mindful of your amounts and frequencies in these types of sugars. We will talk about ways to reduce added sugar, but first let's consider saturated fats. So saturated fat is usually found in animal-based protein sources and is associated with certain health risks. Saturated fat is the biggest contributor to raised low density lipoprotein or LDL cholesterol levels in the diet. Research shows that limiting saturated fat lowers unhealthy cholesterol levels. And it's recommended that we eat no more than 7% of total calories each day from saturated fat. So if you're following a 2000 calorie diet, that would be about 22 grams or less of saturated fat per day. Some sources of saturated fat include fatty cuts of beef or meat, full fat dairy products, again, like cheese, milks, um, and also highly processed or packaged foods and even butter. So again, a few sides, we'll talk about how we can limit your intake of saturated fat, but for now, we're gonna move on to sodium. Sodium is a mineral that is essential for life. It helps to control your body's fluid balance, nerve impulses, and even muscle function. And although this nutrient is important, too much of it may become harmful. Elevated intake of sodium has been shown to contribute to heart disease and hypertension or high blood pressure. The American Heart Association recommends no more than 2,300 milligrams of sodium per day. This equates to about one teaspoon of table salt. On average, Americans consume about 3,400 milligrams of sodium per day. So that's more than 1,000 milligrams than the daily recommendation. Excess sodium easily finds its way to sneak into so many of the foods we enjoy. The American Heart Association actually has a list called the Salty Six, which lists six common foods that are likely providing high levels of sodium to your diet. The list includes breads, pizza, soups, burritos and tacos, sandwiches, and cold cuts or cured meats. High levels of sodium are also often found in highly processed and packaged foods, so be sure to keep a lookout on the Nutrition Facts label. So there are many ways that you can choose healthier, healthier alternatives to reduce added sugar, saturated fat, and sodium. 
We'll start with added sugar first. To reduce added sugar, you might consider satisfying your sweet tooth with items like fruit, which not only will provide some natural sugar, but a variety of additional nutrients like vitamins, minerals, and fiber. You can also look for items that are labeled no sugar added or less sugar when possible. And keep your portion sizes in mind. If you're eating a food that's high, high in sugar, be mindful of your portion size and pay attention to your hunger full and fullness cues. Maybe you can eat a little bit less. To reduce saturated fat, consider the following. Choose lean poultry or lean cuts of meat and trim any visible fat. Consider trying reduced fat dairy products when able. Instead of frying, you might try baking, grilling, broiling, or roasting your food to, again, cut back on that amount of oil and the amount of saturated fat that will be in the food that you're consuming. You might also try to incorporate more unsaturated fats or healthy fats that come from things like olive oils, avocados, nuts, seeds, and fatty fish like salmon. So you might consider a meatless meal one to two times per week. Again, focusing on a plant-based meal can help to reduce your total intake of saturated fat. And finally, use sodium. Look for items labeled no salt added or low sodium when you're able to, and try to season your foods with herbs and spices instead of salt. You might look for no salt added seasoning blends like Mrs. Dash, for example. So I ask you now, think to yourself, how might you go about reducing your intake of sodium, saturated fat, and sugar? Be interesting to consider. Great, so now that you have personalized your nutrition and chosen your meal prep style, you are ready for step three, which is to find some recipes. Now, maybe I'm biased as a dietitian, but this is really where you can start to have some fun and get creative. But we also understand that this part can be overwhelming for people, so let's chat about it. Our first suggestion is to make a list of things that are non-negotiable for you. Things like you or your family's food preferences, maybe you want to consider leftovers, or even if you prefer a certain cooking method. This can really help to narrow your search when finding recipes. Next, find a recipe resource you love and trust. There are so many to choose from and they offer different approaches. For example, if someone in your family has a medical condition with nutrition impact, try searching on websites that apply. Take, for example, the Diabetes Food Hub or the American Heart Association, which offers recipes geared for people with applicable conditions. If you like databases for larger search engines, Websites like Yumly and Eating Well are a great resource. Oftentimes you can search by ingredients or cooking times, which can help you narrow down your ideas. Another great resource is the My Plate Kitchen, where you can consider your various food groups in your recipe selection. Lastly, we recommend saving the recipes that are a win for you or your family and start to build your own recipe collection so that you can look back on when you are in need of inspiration. And then once you have your favorite recipes in your collection, we encourage you to incorporate new recipes in occasionally to keep that variety and new flavors. Our fourth step in the meal planning process is to make your grocery list. Now, before we get to the final grocery list, there are a few steps to consider. First, we recommend making an overall list for all of your recipes. This will include every ingredient in the recipe. This is also a good time to check for missing food groups and also a great time to cross-reference your meals and ingredients with the weekly grocery store ad or app to see what might be on sale or in season for that time. Once your ingredient list is formed, you can go ahead and cross out items you already have on hand. This will result in the start of your grocery list. From this point, you will want to sort your list by aisles in the grocery store. This keeps you organized on your trip and helps you stick to that list. Of course, pen and paper are perfectly acceptable ways to make a grocery list, but if you're needing that added help, try to make a spreadsheet that can be updated regularly, or you could use grocery list apps, 
My current favorite is called Our Groceries, which allows you to share the list between multiple people at once. Now that you have yourself organized, let's look at our final step of the meal planning and prep process. All right, we've made it. We have now come to our fifth and final step of the meal preparation process. It's prep time, everyone. The following are a few considerations to keep in mind when preparing your food. Number one, be sure to set aside time to prepare. Just as you set aside time to go to the grocery store, to clean your house, or to even go to an appointment, schedule that time for your meal prepping. This will help to ensure that it gets done. Number two, use safe cooking practices. This one is so important. Making sure that you take precaution and follow food safety guidelines is key to preventing foodborne illness. You should always wash your hands before handling food and after touching any raw meat, poultry, or seafood. Furthermore, always wash your produce and make sure you're cleaning all surfaces prior to coming in contact with food. You should also use a thermometer to make sure that you're cooking meat, poultry, and seafood to a safe internal temperature. And of course, don't let perishable foods sit out for more than two hours, as this can increase bacterial growth and lead to those foodborne illnesses. Finally, be familiar with how long it is safe to keep food stored in the refrigerator and freezer for. You might refer to resources such as the USDA's Food Keeper app or SaveTheFood.com for more information. Number three, divide your food into appropriate portions and containers and store appropriately. Again, whether that be the freezer, the refrigerator, or wherever it's best to store the food that you've made. And finally, step number four, enjoy your creations. We want you to enjoy the meals you've made and to you know, make sure that you're including foods that you really like. So that's a wrap on the meal planning process. You've learned about steps one through five, and although we've got it down to a system, it's still important to be flexible. Let's see what that looks like. We've taken the time to walk through the meal planning process and to explore all of the many opportunities to help make your weeknights a bit more nutritious and less hectic. All of that being said, it's important that we recognize that life happens. No matter how well you've prepped, how delicious your meals are, or how organized your refrigerator looks, there is always the chance that something will come up that's going to throw a wrench in your plans. This is where it becomes important to be flexible. The meal you thought you were going to eat on Monday for dinner might just have to become Wednesday's lunch. Maybe a friend will invite you out last minute, so you're going to miss one of your prepped meals in order to join them at a favorite restaurant. It's okay. Keep an open mind and be creative about ways that you can use the food that you've prepared. When you're first beginning your meal prep journey, I'd encourage you to live by the motto that less is more. This prevents you from having too much prepped and needing to throw out what you didn't get to or what went bad. Use each week and each meal prep experience as a chance to learn and grow. You'll find that it gets easier and easier over time and that you become better at it. Before you know it, you'll find a way to incorporate meal planning in a way that is almost second nature. Of course, if you find you're having trouble and need more personalized one-on-one -on -one assistance, don't hesitate to reach out to us at Connect Care 3. Kate and I would love to work with you to help you reach your nutrition and health goals and to assist you with meal planning. And now we're gonna talk about putting it all together. So in our attempt to break down a large topic into bite-sized tips, we also wanted to give you some tangible examples and inspiration to leave you with today. Our first few examples are taking you through the process we spoke about today on a larger scale and our last few examples provide you with some ideas of some quick meal planning options to show you that there are multiple ways to approach the meal planning process. <clears throat> Here, you can see that there are several recipes that were chosen for this individual who has already decided on their meal prep style, step one, and has personalized their nutrition, step two. They are now ready to choose their recipes as part of step three. Here are just a few more tips to remember for finding recipes. One, remember to personalize your search. 
search by your nutrition needs, such as heart healthy recipes, and then find recipes with nutrition information. You might notice that some of the recipes seen here are lower in fat and have a balance of all the food groups, which was important for this person. Two, keep in mind your style of meal prep. Are you going to be batch cooking or using ingredient prep? Many of the recipes here could be batch cooked or even turned into make ahead meals by cooking the whole pasta dish or quinoa dish at once. Maybe this person will choose just to use ingredient prep as well to throw together their one pan chicken teriyaki that you saw and again tailor towards their specific needs. Three, find recipes with similar ingredients to help with leftovers. I love trying to do this as it can really help to avoid waste and make your meal planning process more cost effective and easy. Remember, you can start small with just a few days or a few meals at a time. So let's see what this could look like from a meal planning example when you pull these recipes together. So once you have chosen some recipes, it can be helpful to lay out your own meal planning ideas, like on the screen. For example, here you see that similar proteins were considered over these few days, leaving room for leftovers. Chicken in the Greek salad was used for chicken teriyaki, which was then used for leftovers at lunch. A pesto shrimp pasta was used for leftovers in a grilled shrimp salad. Meals can make great snacks as well. Hummus from the Greek bowl used as your snack with cucumbers, and then those leftovers cucumbers used on a tuna sandwich for lunch. It's okay to go back and swap out recipes as well if it's really not fitting in your week. This will certainly be a trial and error, especially as you start out. So take it slow, start small, even if it's just planning out some snacks for the week. Again, we want to encourage you to save your meals and your meal plans you come up with and recipes that you enjoyed for future use. And of course, we can't forget about that fourth step, which is your grocery list step. Here's an example of building an overall list, which you can see on the left side, and then editing for what you already have and sorting by aisles to make your grocery list on the right side. Now this was a, for a family of four, so this might look different depending on your individual needs. This certainly can feel like an involved process, but can get easier with practice and patience. It can also be as involved or as quick as you like. Letting go of that idea that it has to be perfect will help you approach meal planning with an open mind. So let's look at how you might approach meal planning with some simple and quick meal ideas. Awesome. Thank you, Kate. So to wrap up, we're going to share some of our favorite meals to prep. First up, we have a stir fry. Like all the recipes I'm going to share today, I really like this one because there are so many ways to make it your own. First, you'll need to choose your protein. Maybe you have a bunch of chicken that you can use, or maybe you have some steak marinating in the fridge. If you're plant-based, you might enjoy tofu in this dish. Next, you'll need your veggies. You might have done your ingredient prep and chopped and prepped some broccoli, peppers, onions, or maybe sugar snap peas on the weekend. So they're go into your pan. Finally, that you also batch cook some rice and have that waiting in the refrigerator as well. At this point, all you need to do is put all of your ingredients into a pan with a little bit of olive oil over medium heat. Cook until it's heated through, and of course that protein is up to an appropriate temperature and add your favorite sauce or seasoning. In a matter of minutes, you've got a delicious and nutritious meal. Fajitas follow a very similar concept as the stir fry. Again, all you'll need is your protein and a veg ready to heat up. Once they're heated through, add your fajita seasoning, saute, and serve. You can enjoy this on a whole wheat tortilla, over a bed of rice, or make a fajita salad. Don't be afraid to add additional toppings like salsa, avocado, and cheese as well. Another great thing about meal preparation is that you don't have to prep everything from scratch. If you know you have a super busy week ahead, 
Part of your meal planning could have been to purchase frozen veggies or frozen rice that could quickly and easily be heated up as a component to these meals. Who knows, maybe you even chose to look for pre-cooked chicken. Maybe it was a rotisserie chicken or maybe some frozen pre-cooked chicken that just needs to be microwaved. Don't always feel that your options need to be limited to fresh food foods. Frozen and canned options are often just as nutritious, can save you money, and are super convenient. I would note though that you should try to avoid sauces and frozen items and when purchasing canned foods, be mindful of the sodium content. You might look for low sodium or no salt added varieties because sometimes these can be a little bit high in that salt. So keep that in mind. This recipe combines zucchini noodles with regular spaghetti to provide you with the benefits of added veggies without losing the taste and texture of your favorite pasta. This meal may have been one you made completely ahead of time and are choosing to reheat or could be put together the night of. You may have chosen to spiralize your zucchini ahead of time to eliminate one step and maybe you prepped your meatballs ahead of time as well. All this leaves is the need to boil your spaghetti, heat the remaining ingredients, and add your favorite sauce. Again, there's so much room for versatility and personalization here, but this recipe is a great place to start and then add your own flair. We challenge each of you today to try and incorporate at least one aspect of meal planning to your routine in the upcoming weeks. How could a little bit of preparation positively impact your daily life? We can't wait for you to try and find out.